Broadcasting from Manhattan Beach and the World Wide Web, you're listening to CHSR HealthyLife.net. As a service to our listeners, this program is for general information and entertainment purposes only. CHSR HealthyLife.net does not recommend, endorse, or object to the views, products, or topics expressed or discussed by show hosts or their guests. We suggest you always consult with your own personal, medical, financial, or legal advisor. Welcome back to the Dr. Teresa Nicasio Show. This is a place of inspiration and education and hope for a more compassionate and sustainable world. We offer this show to you freely. However, your support and donations really matter. To make a donation or to learn more about sponsorship and advertising opportunities, visit my website at TeresaNicasio.com. That's Teresa with an H, T-H-E-R-E-S-A, Nicasio with an N-I-C-A-S-S-I-O as an octopus, dot com. And be sure to join us next week for our very first live broadcast when the phone lines will be open and Dr. Jessica Renfer will be talking about detoxing in the new year. Dr. Jessica is an integrative naturopathic physician who uses a variety of healing modalities in her work to help patients safely reclaim their health using natural and age-old methods. But I am so excited about today's show uh, because joining us here, we will be talking with the optimistic environmentalist, Dr. David Boyd. Uh, you may already know about Dr. Boyd, but I'm going to share with you a little bit of a, of a bio. Um, put your, put, you know, get comfortable in your seats because he's got quite a, a very special bio. So Dr. David Bob Boyd is an environmental lawyer, professor, and internationally renowned expert on human rights and the environment. He has a Ph.D. in Resource Management and Environmental Studies from the University of British Columbia, a J.D. from the University of Toronto, and a business degree from the University of Alberta. His career has included serving as the Executive Director of EcoJustice, appearing before the Supreme Court of Canada, working as a Special Advisor on Sustainability for Prime Minister Paul Martin, and advising the governments of Sweden, Grenada, and other nations on environmental sustainability. Along with Mayor Gregor Robertson, he co-chairs Vancouver's effort to become the world's greenest city by 2020. He is the author of eight books and over 100 reports and articles on environmental law and policy, human rights, and the constitutional law. His books include The Optimistic Environment, that we'll be talking more about today, uh, Cleaner, Greener, Healthier, A Prescription for Stronger Canadian Environmental Laws and Policies, which we may also be talking about today, we'll see, and The Environmental Rights Revolution, A Global Study of Constitutions, Human Rights, and the Environment. So, David, welcome to the show. Thank you, Teresa. I'm absolutely delighted to be with you today. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, and I just, I, you know, just to come clean here, uh, we could probably spend hours or days <laughs> on this topic. And so, you know, we're just going to give to, you know, get a start here and, you know, um, start talking about this very important topic. Um, but I'm wondering if we could start. I, I'm really about the heart. I love speaking from the heart. So I'm wondering if we could start by, um, you sharing a bit about what led you to write this very special book, The uh, Optimistic Environmentalist, Dave, especially given all that you know. I mean, you're no fool about what's going on in the world around, around environmental issues that we're currently facing. Right. Well, thank you, Teresa. Um, the Optimistic Environmentalist is a book that really had been kicking around in the back of my mind for years as I worked as an environmental lawyer, you know, on the front lines, hearing these horrible stories about climate change and pollution and endangered species day in, day out, and having a lot of friends and colleagues who, quite frankly, ended up suffering from burnout and depression because of the onslaught of bad news. Oh, really? Yeah. Uh, and then, you know, so, I, you know, you have lots of ideas always kicking around in the back of your mind, and uh, this one really came to fruition one day when my daughter, Meredith, who at the time was seven years old, came home on the school bus from school on Pender Island here with tears in her eyes. And, you know, she's like the most amazingly happy, sparkling little kid you could imagine. And I said to her, Meredith, what's wrong? And she said, oh, Papa, 
I learned the most terrible things in school today, and I just was, you know, shocked. You know, what's a seven-year-old learning in school? And I said, well, what, what on earth was it? And she said, well, our teacher told us about global warming and how the ice in the Arctic Ocean is melting and how species like polar bears might even go extinct. And it was, it was really like being punched in the stomach. I mean, the, wow. the, the feeling that I had right at, at that moment was just so crystal clear that I had to do something, not to just address my daughter's fears, but to allay the fears of all of her friends and all of her relatives and all of my colleagues and all of the millions of people, quite frankly, who do see the future as bleak from an environmental perspective. Yes. I just I just have to say, <clears throat> you know, I'm a psychologist. I've been doing this for, like, almost 30 years now, David. And over, I, I hadn't seen this for probably at least the first two decades, but over the past 10 years especially, you know, more and more over the past five, ten years, I've had in my office clients, adult clients, but very much like your daughter. And when you were just now talking, it was giving me shivers and um, making my eyes well up because this is, this is such a huge issue. And, you know, a lot of times we don't talk about it or, you know, or try to find ways to not think about it, you know, whether it's through emotional eating or, or alcohol, drugs, whatever, trying to just pretend it's not happening. But, but things are happening. So, so, so talk about how you're wanting to, you know, what's the voice that you're bringing of hope, um, and, and how can we feel hopeful given all this information about global warming and all the things your daughter mentioned about the right. polar well, bears and this, such. This is the really amazing thing. In, in fact, it was amazing for me. You know, even though I've been working in this field, as a, as a lawyer, you deal with problems. And so it was absolutely phenomenal for me to immerse myself in digging out information about the solutions. Mm-hmm. And I was, uh, you know, day after day I would say to Meredith or say to Margo, my wife, God, you wouldn't believe what I learned today. You know, there's so many good things happening in Canada, in the United States, in Europe, and around the world on all of these issues that are of paramount concern to people right, right, right in every corner uh, of this beautiful planet we call home. So, uh, you know, one example I could give you, just the one that I actually first used with Meredith to try and cheer her up, was telling her the story of sea otters, you know, one of the cutest, most beautiful animals that we know of, mm-hmm. uh, and the very, a, a very compelling story of... Uh, of an environmental problem, a crisis really, that resulted in a solution. So uh, for thousands of years, indigenous people on the west coast of North America had hunted sea otters at a sustainable level because because of their furs and the <coughs> fur of a sea otter. You know, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm an animal rights activist. I love animals, but the fur of a sea otter is one of the most incredible feeling things on the planet. They have over a million hairs per square inch. It's the softest thing you could you could imagine. Wow. And so they were hunted um, and they were used as uh, regalia for the high ranking chiefs of these West Coast indigenous peoples. Uh-huh. And then, of course, along came Europeans and the fur trade, and sea otter populations were decimated. And the last sea otter on the coast of Canada was killed off the coast of Vancouver Island in 1929. And for many decades following that time, there were no sea otters in Canada. And then in the late 1960s, a couple of scientists had a bright idea. They knew there were still some remnant populations of sea otters up in Alaska. Hmm. And so they actually imported uh, 89 sea otters from Alaska down to Canada's west coast, set them free, and in the intervening decades, those sea otters have multiplied and multiplied, and there are now thousands and thousands of sea otters living on the west coast of Canada, flourishing. And so it's it's a story of, uh, it's a remarkable story of how an endangered species can bounce back if humans stop putting pressure on them, and in this case, the, the pressure was hunting. And that's, that's a great, that's that's a great one of a, story. I mean, that's the tip of the iceberg of examples. Where I live here on the West Coast, we're seeing uh, huge numbers of humpback whales, which for the first few years when I lived here, we didn't see at all. But humpback whale populations are booming, uh, and that's, again, in response to an international treaty that stopped the killing of humpback whales. We're seeing Pacific white-sided dolphins that haven't been seen in these waters for over 100 years now coming back, uh, not just in small pods of six or eight animals, but from a ferry last year I saw over 1,000 Pacific white-sided dolphins jumping, leaping out of the ocean, making the ocean water look as though it was boiling because there were so many of them. You actually saw that. Yeah, it was just on a ferry crossing between Pender Island and Victoria. Oh, my God, that must have been just... 
like made your heart sing? Oh, yeah. I mean, these are experiences that just send shocks of electricity up and down your spine, and you can't, mm-hmm. you can't wait to, to tell your family and tell your friends about them. But there's, there's many of these stories. And, you know, the ball, the eagle, this icon of, uh, of wild animals, the bald eagles were in dire, dire jeopardy of going extinct back in the 1960s because of the use of pesticides like DDT. And because countries like Canada and the United States eliminated the use of DDT, which was actually what, what was happening was DDT was bioaccumulating, uh, building up in the food chain. And when it reached the top of the food chain in an in a apex predator like bald eagles, it was causing the, uh, the shell of their eggs to become so thin right. that none of their chicks that. were hatching and surviving. At the time, in the late 1960s, the United States was down to just 400 pairs of bald eagles, if you can imagine. Hmm. And with the, with the elimination of DDT, those bald eagle populations have recovered. There's now over 10,000 pairs of bald eagles nesting in the United States. Wow. You can take a, you can take a trip to uh, Squamish, just north of Vancouver, walk hmm. along the banks of the Squamish River in January when the chum salmon are running, and you can see more than 1,000 bald eagles in a single afternoon. Wow. I mean, this is a species that's gone from the, the precipice of oblivion to becoming abundant and, and, and back to healthy levels. So those are just a few of the stories that I tell in the opening chapter of the book about the way that uh, endangered species are capable, if we do the right things, are capable of uh, amazing recoveries. All right. So, so what are you noticing is the impact of bringing this good news and this voice of hope um, uh, to the to the world with with your book, and I know you've you've been on, doing a lot of speaking, uh, doing a lot of speaking on your tour and such. Uh, what are you, what are you noticing happening uh, with with this work that you're doing, David? Well, it's it's interesting talking to you as a as a psychologist, Therese, because the the single most common uh, response that I get is people come up to me in tears and say, "Thank you, that is just what I needed to hear." The, people are so thirsty for this kind of information that that bringing them, uh, you know, a sip or a, a cup full of it in the, in the form of a book or a presentation really, really seems to be lifting their spirits. And the really critical thing about lifting people's spirits is that, as you said, if people are feeling numbed by bad news, they just kind of tune out and they don't, and they're much less likely to take action. But yep. the really exciting thing about a message of optimism is it's like a catalyst for action. So. You know, people that I talk to, feel they feel rejuvenated, they feel energetic, they feel like they can make a difference. And that's, that's the kind of attitude that's going to get us to these solutions that we so urgently need. Absolutely. <clears throat> it's the sense of, if, if you, you know, you need to have a sense of direction. And, and, and I'd like maybe, you know, a little bit we can talk about some of the things that we can do uh, to be a part of the positive change. And, and I, I think that we've, we've been in this place of complacency, and the complacency has largely, I believe, as again, as a psychologist, it's come out of, of despair. Because if you don't have a sense that you, you can make a difference, then why even try? Uh, you know, I, I remember, you know, even when we just see the, the last, there was an election in the U.S. where, what did they say, 50%, like, uh, half of the of the U.S. population didn't even vote who could have voted. Right. And, you know, regardless of what the outcome was or wasn't, just the mere fact that people aren't stepping up to make to you know put their vote in is 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 just a I think um, uh, an artifact of this larger complacency and this sense of not feeling like they matter. And, and this is something that I think you know and what I'm doing with my website and with this show and my my articles and speaking, I'm, I'm really trying to help people know that they, we matter, you matter, every one of us matters. Um, so, so can you talk a little bit about what we can do? Um, you know, we can feel like one little little drop in the ocean is, you know, but every we, we need those drops in the ocean to make an ocean. Um, what can we as, as citizens, as people on the planet, um, to, to make a difference? Well, there are so many different ways that people can make a difference. I actually wrote a book with David Suzuki a few years ago where we, said, where we looked at all the research on what are the most effective things that people can do. And one of the top things that people can do is you get to make a choice three times a day, breakfast, lunch, and supper, about what you eat. Mm-hmm. And what you eat can really make a huge difference in terms of the sustainability of human, human beings on this beautiful planet. So there's compelling scientific evidence that eating a plant-based diet is not only good for the environment in terms of reducing the, the footprint of your food, 
but it's better for your health as well. So that's that's an easy one, and it's one that that I'm really personally familiar with. I grew up in Alberta, eating uh, a tremendous amount of beef as a child because my uncle uh, had a cattle ranch. And what's really uh, intriguing on, in two ways is one is I became a, a vegetarian about 25 years ago, but also um, my my relatives who now uh, run that agricultural operation they've gotten rid of the cattle uh they've switched their their production methods to organic and they have a, a, a an extremely successful uh, community supported agriculture program which is the kind of program where uh, people in the city pay uh some money up front at the beginning of spring to farmers which helps the farmers buy seeds and that sort of thing and then in exchange the farmers provide them with a weekly basket of you know fresh tasty local, delicious, nutritious, sustainable food. What an inspiring story, from cattle ranching to organic farming. <laughs> that's, that's beautiful. Yeah, it's great. I mean, they, do, they still have a few chickens, and, uh, they, but chickens are great. Chickens are, uh, you know, not everyone's going to become a vegetarian. Chicken is a much more low-impact form of, uh, of protein and animal protein. And although there are, there are as you know, far better than I, there are a tremendous range of uh, very high-protein plant-based products. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, they, you know, it's a mix, and, and you know, I, I talked about in the first show when I did my introduction, I, I explained that I, I'm not about uh, telling anybody what to eat or what not to eat. I'm not even, you know, even though I wrote a vegan book, I'm not vegan myself. Uh, so I'm not about telling anybody what to eat or what not to eat, but gosh, when we can bring in more plant-based foods in our diet, it's, you know, and they're high in water density and high in nutrients, and uh, they're so yummy, uh, especially when you learn good things you can do with them, um, that it can add to all of our lives, whether or not we eat meat or eggs or, or dairy or whatever we eat. Um, but you're right, it's, you know, the research is really coming in that it's, it really has a huge impact on the, as a footprint, uh, our footprint on the planet. But it also, uh, there's there's a lot of research suggesting that the more we can eat uh, um, higher amounts of plant-based foods, it actually may improve our our health, uh, you know, in, in terms of heart disease and diabetes and and all sorts of other kinds of of, um, of issues. So. So thank you for bringing that up, and thank you if you know those of you who know that I've written a book called Yum Plant Based Recipes for a Gluten Free Diet. Um, David, you thank you for being um, you know writing you know, doing a review for the book because um, your voice as an environmental scientist, as a dad, as a human being, and now you know learning about this other connection with the, the cattle farming you know um, history is is you know it adds a real voice of inspiration and we we can change we can do things differently yes and i think food food is a great conversation opener because everyone everyone knows about food everyone has an opinion about food everyone has to eat food uh so it, it really provides multiple levels for engagement absolutely so so food is one way and um you know where we put our money you know uh, i don't know if you want to speak because you know we wrote that book dodging the toxic bullet and um and you know one of the concerns that i i like you know like to bring to people's awareness is around uh, the question about you mentioned organic food and and can you speak a little bit about why organic food might be something for people to think about uh you know supporting more organic farmers um and as opposed to gmo or pesticide um uh, exposed foods yeah well there's really two huge reasons for choosing organic food and, and the first is again going it's a, the first is really uh individual motivation to to protect your health i mean if you're eating organic foods then you know uh certified organic foods have regulatory bodies government agencies have ensured that those foods are free from artificial uh, pesticides and a lot, lot again there's an incredible body of scientific research that shows that for example there was a test done in the United States on children who they actually measured the uh, the amount of pesticide metabolites in these children's urine and then they switched these children to an organic diet and within days their bodies were free of these toxic pesticides so well, uh, within days. Within days, yeah, that's right. Because that's the, incredible. Often have a, a short. All right. Well, David, we're going to be having to take a short break, uh, folks. Um, but we're going to be coming back and talking more with this wonderful man, Dave, Dr. David Boyd. And I'm um, thinking, Dave, maybe after the, the, you know, after the break, we might be able to talk a little bit about. Uh, at some point, maybe a little bit about your eco-justice project, maybe a little bit about when you've uh, 
we're at the Sprint Supreme Court, uh, and maybe also a little bit about the this, that huge greening project you're doing with Vancouver. If that's does that sound like a plan? Happy to talk about all of those things. Oh, Lisa. fantastic. Okay, so folks, stick around. We're going to hear more from Dr. David Boyd after the break. Being inspired by a speaker while learning everyday positive information that you can use to help your life is exactly what Dr. Teresa Nicasio does when she speaks in front of your group. From healthcare professionals to special needs parenting and everything in between, Dr. Teresa Nicasio can customize topics for your group on everything from health to psychology. To book Dr. Teresa Nicasio as a speaker for your group, visit yumfoodforliving.com or call 604-445-6463. That's 604 604- Four four five six four six three. For all your live or pre-recorded webcasting needs, come to EarthChannel.com. Get your web-based message out to a select group or the whole world. It's easy. A pioneer in webcasting, EarthChannel.com provides the best products and services to big corporations and government users. And now this same technology is available to you. They have the best EarthCast encoders, servers, and products to meet your technical needs. But wait, don't want to mess with technical stress? No problem. They'll do it for you. EarthChannel.com is your answer. You can use webcasting for lots of things like advertising, marketing, customer support, training, and don't forget, web radio and TV. In fact, you're listening to a live EarthCast right now. So come to EarthChannel.com. Actualize your audio or video webcasting needs today. You can't beat the friendly service or the price. Call EarthChannel.com at 1-800-849-8978. That's 1-800-849-8978. YumFoodForLiving.com is the place to get easy, allergy-free recipes, all free of sugar, gluten, and dairy. But that's not all you'll get when you visit YumFoodForLiving.com. You'll get resources for all kinds of things like wellness articles, videos, podcasts, a blog, all to help you create easy, healthy living. There's even a 50-page downloadable book introducing you to the philosophy of yum. Don't wait. Visit yumfoodforliving.com. Yumfoodforliving.com. That's yumfoodforliving.com. If you like to spend your television viewing time learning about some of the things that you may have missed in history class, or if history was your favorite subject, then you should check out the link to the History Channel on the HealthyLife.net advertiser page. Order DVD sets by series or by subject matter right from our homepage while you still enjoy your favorite HealthyLife.net show. You're listening to HealthyLife.net, the radio network that brings positive talk with positive change to make your world a little better. Welcome back to the Dr. Teresa Nicasio Show. For those of you who are just joining us, we have been talking with the internationally renowned expert on human rights and the environment, Dr. David Boyd. Love this man. Um, so before the break, uh, we were talking a bit about, um, about, you mentioned about your daughter bringing up climate change and so forth, Dave. I wonder if we could start, the, you know, this talking a little bit about about um, your, you know, what you've learned and what you're wanting to share around that topic. Sure. Well, this this is actually the single most ex- exciting thing that I learned in the course of researching this book. You know, people people have heard about renewable energy, but there is a renewable energy revolution that is sweeping this planet. That when you learn about the details of it, you cannot help but feel better. You can't help but be inspired. So, for example, solar power. Uh, over the past 16 years. We've seen uh, an explosive growth in the amount of solar panels generating elect- clean, green electricity around the world. In fact, in, two- in the year 2000, the world's leading uh, international energy forecasting organization, a group called the International Energy Agency, uh, at the time there was about 1 billion gigawatts of s- installed solar power in the world, which is a big number, but uh, far short of what the world needs to, needs to carry on. Uh, and this group of experts predicted that if the, if the right policies were put in place by governments and if businesses invested sufficient money, we could have seven times as much solar power, seven gigawatts, by the year 2020. Well, here we are in the year 2016, and 
we have blown past 7 gigawatts. Last year we blew past 200 gigawatts. So the total amount of solar that these experts thought the world would have in 2020, we actually add to the global electrical grid every six weeks. And the price of solar, the reason this is happening is not because everyone has joined Greenpeace. It's because the price of solar has come down. Oh, nice. Over 90% since the 1970s. Wow. That's incredible. So 90% has come down. The price has come down by over 90%. Wow. That's and so that's now fantastic. solar, it, you know, it doesn't matter if you're, if you're green or not. Solar is competitive in many, many countries with every other form of energy. It's, it's just, so do, it's do you find that it's, um, it ends up being uh, the, the, just on, a, on your own little pocket, pocketbook that you end up spending less with solar, or is there still uh, some room to move on that one? Uh, in, in, many, in many countries, including sunny parts of the United States and Australia, solar is cheaper than any other form of electricity. That is fantastic. Yeah, it's amazing news for the planet. And there's a similar pattern with respect to wind and wind turbines. Costs have been dropping dramatically there. Well, so, that is... so, so that goes actually brings us back to that one of the things that's really at the heart of what we're talking about today, which is action inspired by optimism. So when I learned this about solar electricity, I thought, my God, why don't we do something about it? Yeah. So instead of just talking about it. So got together with some folks here on Pender Island, and we started a new volunteer organization called the Pender Solar Initiative. And in the last two, two years, we've put, we put 40 solar panels on the roof of the local recycling depot. Uh, this year, we put over 100 panels on the roof of the local school. And so all of these school children helped us with the fundraising effort. And all of these school children now understand that they can be part of the solution. Their parents can be part of the solution. There's this solar, solar photovoltaic panels on the roof of the Pender Island School are generating tens of thousands of dollars worth of electricity every year. And it's just a, it's an amazing sense of empowerment that, that the entire community has. But particularly, I like to emphasize those kids who did, you know, everything from bake sales to sleepovers in the gymnasium, school gymnasium to raise money for the solar panels. Wow, that is so amazing. Wouldn't that be great? I just had an idea of, like, uh, having even a whole um, science fair where kids do different aspects around solar, solar energy, solar panels, maybe so, or other alternative things, and, and, um, and giving them that sense of empowerment, like you're saying. Right, and so, but any parent who's listening to your show who lives in a place where there's good sunshine could, yeah. could get together with other parents and start a solar project at their school. I mean, what That's a, a great idea. I generation. love that. I love that. So it's like it's time to. I, what was that quote you just said? That you, you know, action inspired by optimism. Um, you know, this is this is the time. The time is now. And um, I know my husband. You know, my husband Eric Mazzi. I, I actually met David years ago. Uh, my husband and, and David were actually students at um, with the same advisor, Hadi, right? That's right. Yeah. At, at UBC, and I met them on their graduation day of their PhD. So this is a long time ago, and we, you know, we really didn't know each other, but we, you know, had that nice that nice meeting and the idea of of you know shifting to 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 making the changes and stepping up to the plate and if, if we have a plan if we have a plan of action we can do something if we don't have a plan then we we kind of are buffled, uh, befa- um, or befuddled uh, so when i tell clients who are feeling anxious and depressed there's, I learned a two-stage two model years ago, like 30 years ago almost, uh, for dealing with anxiety, and, and it was uh, gather information and do something. You know that those two steps were really important. It didn't really matter what you did, uh, but I've added a third stage to that model, and that is of having a plan of action. So you're, you're outlining a plan of action. That okay, folks, you know, get you, get the kids together. And let's let's. It's fine wherever you've got sunshine. Let's make do solar panels. Well, and here's an amazing connection between what you just said and the work that I do. So, plan of action. That's exactly what we did for the city of Vancouver. Ah, uh, so talk more about that. Mayor Gregor Robertson asked me to co-chair his Greenest City Initiative, and I, of course, I said, yeah, "Sure, I would love to." We put together a group of about 20 leading business people, environmental experts, and we came up with a with a plan to become the greenest city in the world by 2020, with mm-hmm. targets and timelines. And what Gregor said, which ties into your last point about a plan of action, the mayor of Vancouver said to us, I want more. I want actions that we can start on tomorrow. He really wanted 
what he called quick start action. So we did another report where we put together 44 things that the city of Vancouver could do right away. Wow. In this case, he wanted to get them started for political reasons before the 2010 Olympics. And by the time the Olympics started, uh, 39 of those 44 actions were already underway or complete. And now here we are seven years later, we can, we can see the progress that the city of Vancouver is making. For example, we had a, we had a target to, uh, to get to 50% of all trips in the city of Vancouver by walking, cycling, or public transit by 2020. Well, we, a- we actually hit that target this year. So we're ahead of schedule, and, and the, the momentum is building. People are excited. People are supportive. And it all comes back to having, the, having an objective and having a plan for fulfilling that objective. Great. And so um, we can, we're going to talk a little bit more about that when we, we're going to have to take another break. It just, that time just flies. Time does fly. Um, but I'm wondering if, uh, if there's, you know, there's your book that's going to have a ton, a ton of uh, resources. And also if you might have a, you know, maybe even that list of 44 would be really fun or, or something like that, that we can add to your profile page on the website. So if people want to have something they can do right away, let's get folks started and, and get, the, get, get them lubricated. Right, that would be a great. That's a great idea to me. Super. Thank okay, you. so don't go away. We're gonna. Uh, we have more with David, Dr. David Boyd, right after the break. There's a book that makes it so easy to embrace a healthy, gluten-free lifestyle, even kids will like it. Filled with heartwarming stories, food as medicine health tips, easy allergy-free recipes, and creative culinary inventions, the award-winning book Yum! by Dr. Teresa Nicasio is your source for all of this and more. So make gluten-free living easy, tasty, and fun. Get Yum! plant-based recipes for a gluten-free diet at Amazon.com. Or visit yumfoodforliving.com. That's yumfoodforliving.com. What does HealthyLife.net and Amazon.com have in common? Well, they're both available on the Internet. They both give great value. But most important, most of our positive program hosts and guests are accomplished authors. And their books are available from, you got it, Amazon.com. Now it even gets better than that. Because when you're listening on air to a HealthyLife.net host or guest, you can go directly to Amazon.com and you can order your book while you're still listening to your favorite HealthyLife.net program. So when you hear an author you like, go to the homepage of HealthyLife.net and click on Amazon.com. When you have a food allergy or dietary limitation, Dr. Teresa Nicasio knows it's hard to give up the foods you love, so she decided to put on her chef hat and give you affordable, personalized culinary consultations that will light up your taste buds. You'll explore substitute ingredients so you can enjoy your favorite foods again. She'll even help you make food preparation easy and guide you on your path to healthy living. And to get started, all you have to do is call 604-445-6463. That's 604 604- Four four five sixty four sixty three. HealthyLife.net, the positive radio network. YumFoodForLiving.com is the place to get easy, allergy-free recipes, all free of sugar, gluten, and dairy. But that's not all you'll get when you visit YumFoodForLiving.com. You'll get resources for all kinds of things like wellness articles, videos, podcasts, a blog, all to help you create easy, healthy living. There's even a 50-page downloadable book introducing you to the philosophy of yum. Don't wait. Visit yumfoodforliving.com. Yumfoodforliving.com. That's yumfoodforliving.com. HealthyLife.net, the positive radio network. Welcome back to the Dr. Teresa Nicasio Show, where we celebrate everyday heroes and work together to make the world a better place. And we're here again with Dr. David Boyd, who is talk about a um, a stimulator, and a, you know he's he's just a regular guy like you and me who happened to get like all kinds of crazy degrees and has is just making a big difference on the planet. And he, given his experiences and the information and knowledge he has, he is wanting to empower us so that every one of us, because being alive and staying alive is every day a heroic act. So he's helping to equip us to be even more heroic uh, in, our, in our process. And in particular, he's talking about 
being, you know, how we can be more heroic in terms of helping save our, our, our environment and make a difference, um, maybe even some things around, you know, human rights and um, just kindness in, to our planet, kindness to our bodies. So welcome back, David. Great to be back. Thank you, Teresa. Yeah, so I was just telling David during break, I love that he's fired up. I can just feel it in his voice. I can hear it. You probably can, too. So we're just going to keep on a roll here. We're talking about what we can do and, and the, the recommendations that David has. Yeah, and I wanted to follow up on, on that this discussion of solar that we had because a lot of people ask questions about solar, like, you know, what about the solar panels? You know, Are, are they made with toxic substances? Or how long do they last? Well, the good news there is that solar panels have a 30-year warranty, so they're going to last at least 30 years. But even more important than that, um, there's, there's, a, there's a concept that's now being talked about by scientists called a circular economy. And what they mean is an economy that's really based on the genius of Mother Nature, where there is no waste at all, where mm. everything gets reused and recycled in a circular, circular sense. And so the connection there to solar panels is that last year, a company started manufacturing solar panels that are 100% recyclable. So at the end of 30 or 40 years, when they're finally given up the ghost, those panels can be brought back to the manufacturer and made into new solar panels. So there's, no, there's nothing going to landfills. There's nothing going to garbage dumps. And they have, uh, they have re-engineered those panels to eliminate the use of toxic substances. So what was already a clean source of electricity is just kind of it's gone into the future in almost a science fiction way with these incredible leaps forward in technological ingenuity that's that's that really is beautiful and and one of the things when um, years ago we went on a trip uh, as a family and, and uh, whale watching, which, um, as you know, some of those are not the, the most kind and friendly ones, but this was one that was really uh, structured to be really respectful of the animals and environmentally friendly. But on that trip, there we, we, we passed a an old uh, talk about Aboriginal community, a former Aboriginal community, and, and and literally you would almost like not know that it had been there. Because of the zero waste, right? There's no, that's so right. And so, what, what what you call a uh, what what archaeologists call a shell midden is that's actually uh, a pile. It can be meters deep in the um, in the beaches in this area on the coast of North America called a shell midden. It's just it is actually the in quotation marks garbage dump of the indigenous peoples because it's where the uh, the clam shells and the oyster shells have piled up over millennia, but it's obviously not waste in the sense that we think of waste, which is, you know, the horrific garbage that our society creates. Mm-hmm. Right. And so that's really an important thing. So, you know, what can people do? Well, people can make choices. They, they can make choices about what they eat. They can make choices about what they buy. I mean, consumers have incredible power to drive the marketplace towards cleaner, greener, healthier products. And people really have to use their democratic rights and, and vote. Vote for local politicians. Vote for state and provincial politicians. Vote for federal politicians. Some people may think they're all the same. I can tell you they're not. There is an incredible difference between politicians that respect and care for the environment and the things that they do to protect the environment and politicians who don't have that environmental gene. And so, you know, voting, uh, eating, buying... Almost everything you do has an environmental element, and you can make a difference by wise choices. So true. And, you know, even about the eating of food that's, you know, the more we can, getting things that are local, but, uh, you know, food waste, that's one of my big agendas. I'm so concerned about the huge amount of, was like 40% of the food that, uh, you know, ends up in landfills. Well, and that's just, it's, it's, it's immoral. Food waste is immoral because not only is it savaging the planet, but there's still a billion people on this beautiful planet that, that don't get enough uh, calories on a daily basis. So we really, we really need to come up with strong, strong solutions to addressing food waste. And, and those solutions are out there. I mean, one of the most fabulous things I've picked up at the grocery store in the last year or two is a bag of what are called ugly potatoes. I love this ugly, this ugly food that are just movement. slightly misshapen or they might have like a, a, a mark on them. They're perfectly fine. They're fantastic food. And two years ago, those potatoes would have been just thrown out, not even brought into the food pro- process, 
food marketing system, but now you can buy them in a bag at the grocery store. I love that. I, I've gotten some of those sorts of food at the um, farmer's market, and, and just I love that. You know, it's not only, like, great for the environment, but it's actually fun. You know, it, as a psychologist, part of my training was assessment, and one of the things you may have heard of ink blot tests or yeah. Rorschach. Rorschach tests. Where, you know, you look at a picture, and, and you, you think, what is that? And, and so we can do that with kids, or you look up in the clouds, you know, what do you see in the clouds? Well, I'm telling you, some of these things I see in social media with the the, uh, the ugly food i mean i see animals i see i mean i see all kinds of fun things and it can be you know kind of a, a, an artistic and psychological thing so you know what do you see in this potato you know right. and, well, and psychologically where did we ever get the idea that all all fruit and produce has to look perfect i mean we right. have apple trees here and they produce all kinds of crazy shapes of apples but they're all delicious yes they're all beautiful and and you know just like we are Right, That's and we think right. about differences of of our human beings, and you know, where do we get the idea that our face is supposed to all, you know, we're supposed to all be look a certain way, have a certain shape. That's um, a very powerful message, Teresa. It is, and it's 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 so it's so it's so huge in our society, and this is I think that this is raising that question of all the way because inside there's so much nutrient, there's so much beauty in each of us, and we we all have things to offer. It may just be packaged differently. Absolutely. Yeah. So before we finish real quickly, I know we have less than a minute here, but what, what would be one or two take-homes that you would like to uh, give to our, our listeners today? Oh, well, I mean, really the most powerful message that I can offer is that find some good news. Read, read my book. Read your, read your book. Find some good news about the environment and be inspired by that. Do Take one action that's different tomorrow. Take another action that's different the next day. And what you'll find is a virtuous circle where you'll just be feeling better, more optimistic, more engaged, and you'll be contributing to a cleaner, greener, healthier planet, not just for us, but for our children and our grandchildren. Fantastic. And it's the Optimistic Environmentalist. And what is your website? Uh, OptimisticEnvironmentalist.com. OptimisticEnvironmentalist.com. And there's a whole bunch more I have about David. I might be adding more soon on my website at TeresaNicasio.com. Thank you for coming, Dave. We've got to go. But after the break, um, I'll be answering your questions with the Because You Ask segment. Thank you so much, Teresa. Oh, you're so welcome, David. Thank you. Being inspired by a speaker while learning everyday positive information that you can use to help your life is exactly what Dr. Teresa Nicasio does when she speaks in front of your group. From healthcare professionals to special needs parenting and everything in between, Dr. Teresa Nicasio can customize topics for your group on everything from health to psychology. To book Dr. Teresa Nicasio as a speaker for your group, visit yumfoodforliving.com or call 604-445-6463. That's 604 604- Four four five six four six three. If you're like the 8 out of 10 women that say finding genes that fit is a problem, well, your problem is solved. Lee Genes has done extensive research, and they have genes that fit. There's even an online Lee Fit Finder so you can find the right fit for you. Imagine jeans that instantly slim you with a custom fit and no gap waistband. And guys, kids, Lee has jeans for you, too. Click through to Lee's Jeans on the HealthyLife.net advertiser page and get what fits. When you have a food allergy or dietary limitation, Dr. Teresa Nicasio knows it's hard to give up the foods you love, so she decided to put on her chef hat and give you affordable, personalized culinary consultations that will light up your taste buds. You'll explore substitute ingredients so you can enjoy your favorite foods again. She'll even help you make food preparation easy and guide you on your path to healthy living. And to get started, all you have to do is call 604-445-6463. That's 604-445-6463. There's a book that makes it so easy to embrace a healthy, gluten-free lifestyle, even kids will like it. Filled with heartwarming stories, food as medicine health tips, easy allergy-free recipes, and creative culinary inventions, the award-winning book, Yum! by Dr. Teresa Nicasio, is your source for all of this and more. So make gluten-free living easy, tasty, and fun. Get Yum! 
plant-based recipes for a gluten-free diet at Amazon.com. Or visit yumfoodforliving.com. That's yumfoodforliving.com. Radio your way. HealthyLife.net. Welcome back. You're listening to the Dr. Teresa Nicasio Show, where we celebrate life, love, and kindness, um, while also acknowledging the challenges that are a part of living. But as we were just talking about with Dr. David Boyd, also finding solutions for, uh, to make things better. And on that note, we have the Because You Ask segment, um, which is the part of the show where I answer your questions. About, it can be about anything. It can be about psychology, health. It can be environmental stuff, parenting, relationships, gardening, pets, cooking, whatever. Um, but to send your question in, just click on the Ask Teresa tab on my website, which is TeresaNicasio.com. T H E R E S A Nicasio N with an uh, and Nancy N with a Nancy I C A S S I O dot com. Uh, you can also email me at Teresa at Teresa Nicasio dot com. Um, and so for this on that on that note of noticing something and going uh, forward with solutions, um, I'd like to address a question that came in to, uh, for today's because you asked. It's about the holidays. This question comes from Berna BBC. Uh, Dear Teresa, can you explain why so many people push back against using an all-inclusive phrase, Happy Holidays, over Merry Christmas? As someone who is not Christian, it doesn't seem like that much to ask, especially given the multicultural society that we live in. I would appreciate any insights you have about this question. Baffled in Burnaby. So I want to say baffled. I love that you asked this question. And, um, and you know, recently I was just thinking about something really similar. Um, I was uh, thinking about how, you know, we just, this is like the Christmas season for many people. Not for everybody, though. It's many other holidays and non-holiday time that people enjoy during this time. But around this idea of Christmas, um, I was thinking about how kids who don't get presents from Santa and the implications of that. And I thought I'd share a little story about when my daughter, my oldest daughter, Alex, she was six, and she asked me um, if some of her friends were naughty or bad because Santa didn't bring them presents for Christmas. She asked, like, in a hushed voice, and it was just, it made, it was just like, it was really concerning her. So, you know, as a mom, that's pretty powerful, and as people in society, that's, that's a really profound message. So, you know, straight from the mouths of babes, we get some of the, the richest things. So I thought I'd talk a little bit about that and also mention about, how, you know, there's also that unspoken question of privilege about why is it that some kids receive, like, really extravagant gifts and other kids, you know, don't receive any or maybe are lucky to get a, a modest dollar store gift. You know, if they get really extravagant gifts, does that mean they were really good? And, and the ones who got the, the dollar store gift, are they like a little bit more naughty? You know, these messages that we don't realize that we're, we're giving are, are pretty disconcerting. Um, you know, I, I went to, um, I went to this, this website I found about the holidays and it actually even had a question, um, or it had, it has things about, ask, ask children questions so they can see if they're on the, uh, on Santa's naughty or nice list. And they have a running list, um, where there's a thumb up or a thumb down. And again, from a, from a, many perspectives around anxiety and such, the messages are, you know, worth speaking about. So I'd like to say, you know, in terms of your question about why is it that people are resistant to, changing what they say from Merry Christmas to Happy Holidays, um, it's really an easy answer because really psychologically we know that it's natural to believe that our own way of thinking and doing things is the right way. We just, of course, it's the right way we think, right, um, even if it's not. So it can really be hard to appreciate the, you know, the world through another person's eyes and this is a really big question why um, I, this is a, one of the big reasons why I'm also uh, um, very committed to educating around inclusivity and appreciating differences of all sorts because it really can be difficult for a lot of people to understand. And uh, the reality is, is, is I really believe that most people in their hearts want to be kind, 
and inclusive, at least in principle. Um, but, you know, as long as it doesn't mean that they need to actually change their own behavior or thoughts is often the, the, the you know, the butt that goes in there. So because of this, this, this tendency of human beings, um, you, you know, we, you might find that 11 months of the year, most people can be really inclusive in, in many ways. But then once December rolls around, they suddenly seem to be blind to how the resistance to just replacing Merry Christmas with Happy Holidays impacts others. And this, this was really brought home, I think, recently with the Starbucks uh, controversy that people were up in arms. Some people were even talking about maybe they should uh, boycott Starbucks because they uh, were no longer putting Merry Christmas on the cards, uh, on, the, on the, their mugs. Um, and it's that, that, that lack of understanding about the impact on others. Um, and it re- reminds me a little bit of the, the big Girl Scout cookie controversy that, that was just, gosh, that was a few years ago, I guess, when uh, people were up in arms that they were making Girl Scout cookie, cookies gluten-free so that even children who are gluten-sensitive could eat them. I mean, it seems, you know, when you think about it, it seems pretty silly. But in the moment, this is something that people felt was sacred, you know, their, their Girl Scout cookies had to be as unhealthy as possible, and of course with gluten. So it's kind of like, of course, you know, you just say Merry Christmas, and that should be fine. So I want to thank you, um, uh, Baffled, again, um, because we are now in an, a, a different, you know, we're a different society. We have a rainbow culture, and it's it's a blend of people. If it was a homogenous community, that would be one thing. So the rules for kindness have changed, and so it, it really resonates for me with the inclusive cooking initiative that I've been talking a lot about um, with my book, with my public speaking, and with, with all kinds of, with my writing, um, encouraging everyone to share food that everyone can also enjoy so that no one is, you know, it feels like they're left behind or is left behind. So I'd like to say that, you know, when simple acts of kindness, like breaking bread together inclusively or saying happy holidays, are so easy, and there's such accessible ways for us to bring people of all backgrounds and religions together. Why not just say yes to it, to do it, especially since the message of being heart-centered and not excluding anyone is really what the holidays are, are really about anyway. So, you know, on that note, I, I hope this answer is helpful for you, Baffled, and also that it helps others to understand more about the complexities and some of the significant emotional and social implications um, associated with this issue, which, again, seems so benign. Um, thank you for your courage in asking such an important question. Um, and I just want to speak real quickly then. Uh, we'll finish off with that question. I'd like to encourage all of you to keep sending in your awesome questions questions. These are, you know, I like it when it's, you know, we can really think deeply about things and, and make changes that, that are easy to do but make a difference in the world. Um, so I really love hearing from you. And even if I'm not able to answer your question, I can't answer all the questions that come in. Um, sometimes I, I choose one that's relevant to a theme. Um, that Just go ahead and send them in and you can access it from my website, TeresaNicasio.com. So don't go away. We're going to be right back with our closing comments. There's a book that makes it so easy to embrace a healthy, gluten-free lifestyle, even kids will like it. Filled with heartwarming stories, Food as Medicine Health Tips, Easy Allergy-Free Recipes, and Creative Culinary Inventions. The award-winning book, Yum! by Dr. Teresa Nicasio, is your source for all of this and more. So make gluten-free living easy, tasty, and fun. Get Yum! Plant-Based Recipes for a Gluten-Free Diet at Amazon.com or visit YumFoodForLiving.com. That's YumFoodForLiving.com. Shh! Over here. Here's a secret for a virus-free computer. ESET. They've been a pioneer in the antivirus industry for over 25 years. 25 years of innovative, top-rated antivirus protection. ESET's award-winning security solutions provide a safe online experience for over 100 million home and business computer owners. They are so affordable, fast, and simple to use. So be gone, you blue screen of death. ESET's on my computer. If it's not on yours, visit HealthyLife.net's advertiser page and click on ESET now. 
When you have a food allergy or dietary limitation, Dr. Teresa Nicasio knows it's hard to give up the foods you love, so she decided to put on her chef hat and give you affordable, personalized culinary consultations that will light up your taste buds. You'll explore substitute ingredients so you can enjoy your favorite foods again. She'll even help you make food preparation easy and guide you on your path to healthy living. And to get started, all you have to do is call 604-445-6463. That's 604 604- 445-6463. HealthyLife.net, where positive overcomes negative. Welcome back. You're listening to the Dr. Teresa Nicasio Show. I hope you've enjoyed this show. I know I sure have. I thank you, Dr. David Boyd, for joining us. If you or someone you know would like to be a sponsor for this show, do let me know by emailing me at Teresa at TeresaNicasio.com or getting information about it on my website. You can also check out my website about donating to the show as well. And thank you so much for joining me and my wonderful guests. Today, my, uh, you know, David was wonderful, and be sure to tune in next week when Dr. Jessica Renfer is going to be joining us live, woohoo, our first live show, to talk about natural detoxing for the new year. So until next time, remember that you matter, and we do have options to make changes, and have create, we have some plans of action, and that together we can help make the world a kinder and more sustainable place, one act at a time. See you next week.